Seattle-based, local Seattle-based freelance journalist, um, local Pacific Northwest longtime environmentalist, and the author of Must Read Book, which is also here for purchase of Orcas and Men, Mr. David Nywert. So yeah, this is uh, of Orcas and Men. It'll be out, or it's going to be out in paperback next week, and hard covers over there. I'll be happy to sign them afterwards. Um, the book is really kind of about uh, the relationship of humans to killer whales, both in the wild and and in captivity. Um, most of my focus has been with wild orcas, uh, but uh, you can't help but look at uh, what's happened to those in captivity especially when you're dealing with those here in the Puget Sound, because after all, <clears throat> the southern resident killer whales really provided the entire foundation for the whole captive market industry back in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and, and Howard was just talking about how, uh, or mentioning how he wants to, uh, when we get Lolita back here, uh, start calling her Tokite again, <clears throat> which reminded me of the whole bizarre story of how she got named Lolita in the first place. Because Tokite was in fact her original name that they gave her when they captured her. <laughs> and uh, they, they named her that because she was a two or three year old calf, young female, being placed in a tank with this very, this adult, very large adult male named Hugo. And they were hoping they would mate. And so they named her Lolita after the character in the Vladimir Nabokov novel. It, and it's just kind of disgusting because it, it really is, I think, re reflective of the sort of perversity of the entire uh, animal or orca captivity enterprise from its very beginnings. And, and ultimately, that's what this is about both in the wild and in captivity, we're talking about trying to overturn this, one of the worst traits of humankind, which is our, our certainly Western civilization, which is our love of dominance and control. Um, dominance, the drive for dominance and control has brought us war and genocide, and it's brought us animal exploitation. And particularly, uh, I mean, the, the whole zoo um, enterprise right from the start, the whole animal display enterprise from the start was founded by you know, kings trying to display their ability to, power, to dominate and control the world. And that's what they, happens at these parks. If you go to SeaWorld or Miami Seaquarium or any of these parks where, these marine parks where the, the essence of the show is, is entertainment, what you're getting, you know, they love to talk about how, how oh, well, we're, we're educating these kids, we're inspiring them, and all that sort of thing. Well, um, you know, I was at SeaWorld Orlando just about a week and a half ago. Uh, I went there to check up on Telecom. And a uh, quick report, Telecom is actually doing okay. Uh, he, his recent blood work showed an uptick. Uh, there's actually hope that he might survive. Um, which was not the way it looked about a month ago, uh, which is no doubt why SeaWorld pulled, hit the panic button and uh, did their reboot of their process. They were clearly trying to get out in front of T Telecom's in imminent death, and uh, Telecom has so far kind of outwitted them once again. Uh, he's still alive, uh, which means there's still hope for eventually getting him into a sea pen someday. Yes. Um, so, for that note, at any rate, what, what was really remarkable was the, the kind of, once again, I mean, I've been to SeaWorld several times, and this is always the case. But, uh, of course, they're trying to update their spiel now, so they're making it even more environmentally friendly, right? <laughs> And it's, it's just kind of a farce. I mean, um, I was also at Miami's Aquarium back in October uh, with, with uh, Naomi Rose, and we were checking up on Lolita. Uh, she looked pretty grim. It uh, looked to me like they had 
uh, an algae bloom out there in the waters off of Miami, and so they were overcompensating for the algae bloom by putting too much chlorine into her tank because she was just squinting the whole time we were there. And the spiel that they were giving at Miami's Aquarium was this thing, it, 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 you could tell that it just bored the entire audience because they were just talking about how, well, she should never go free again. <laughs> and that's all it was, was a sort of self-justification spiel for why they should keep her in captivity. And uh, most of these people were just there with their three-year-olds, you know, to show them the work. Uh, so they didn't really care, and most of them actually were Spanish-speaking anyway, so they probably were barely listening to what they were saying. But Naomi Rose and Sam Berg and I were up in the top seats and watching them and going, oh yeah. <laughs> it was like they were talking to us because it was all, you know, we're, uh, we're justifying our, our existence by keeping this animal in captivity. Well, um, at SeaWorld in Orlando, the same thing was going on. They were doing a lot of propaganda stuff. Uh, you know, justifying themselves. And uh, the funny thing was they loved to give this conservation message, but the stuff, the conservation advice that they were giving kids was not a single thing that would actually help wild killer whales. Uh, let's see, eat sustainable fish. Well, actually, if you really want to help wild whales, you should only eat wild salmon. You should not eat farm fish at all. Um, anyway, <laughs> especially here in the Northwest. But, um, that, that not was standing. I mean, they, they just gave a, a lot of advice uh, that was totally useless. Uh, you know, if they really wanted to tell kids how to help wild killer whales, they would have said, hey, first of all, let's not capture them anymore. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, these guys, they took 58 killer whales out of this southern resident population out of a population of about, estimated about 150, 160, well over a third of the population. And they targeted all the young. They targeted all these tw these little two and three year old calves because they were easier to transport and easier to train and, and all that sort of thing. So what they functionally did was they took out an entire generation's worth of reproductive capacity. And uh, for them as well. And so when we hit the 90s, uh, and they, they got hit with the double whammy of salmon declines, they, the population dropped really to the endangered level again. And that's why they're endangered to this day. It's primarily, it got all started because of SeaWorld and its captures. So they really have a moral obligation to help people up here and to help these killer whales up here. And they recently have announced that they're going to be investing in um, <clears throat> research up here, $10 million worth of research, supposedly, uh, to help wild killer whales. Uh, I think that's a great first step. But I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I will believe that they're serious about helping us and helping these wild killer whales when we come and see them actually take part in helping the salmon habitat recovery. Um, these whales are starving to death out here. And if we do not uh, help them get rid of those dams on the Snake River, or help them recover the salmon here in the, in the, in the sound, they'll be gone. So yeah, uh, here's what I want from SeaWorld. I want to see them do this uh, campaign where they're helping to take down those dams on the Snake River. You know? Um, where they, they help to remove some of the pollutants, or they help to reduce the levels, extreme levels of noise that these killer whales out here are having to deal with due to shipping, particularly in Harrow Strait. Um, all of these things are issues that the wild killer whales face, and it's all reflected in what's going on with the, uh, the captive industry. You know, the, the desire to keep hanging on to these whales for their exploitation and and to just use them for our entertainment is so profoundly wrong, especially now that we know, have learned so much about these whales, thanks mainly to the scientists who studied them in the wild, we know that they're, they're incredibly spatially deprived, they're socially deprived, and uh, they're, they're undergoing extreme sensory deprivation because you put a, an animal whose primary sense is their echolocation, into a plain concrete tank. And it's like putting a human being into a plain white room. You drive them insane, uh, eventually. I mean, really, the miracle is that the more killer whales haven't 
killed more traders in the past, really. Um, so, and I, and I think it speaks volumes to these animals' amazing mental strength and their amazing kindness and their sense of humor, uh, which we can all see in the wild, um, but we can also, we know just for these animals in captivity. So, uh, you know, someday SeaWorld's going to have to get into the reality. And the reality is that those whales need to be, the captive-born whales need to put, be put into sea sanctuaries where they can have a decent life, seawater, and real fish, and real sea bottom, and they can actually use their echolocation again. Uh, and the wild-born whales need to be returned to their native waters as close as they can. Uh, it begins with Lolita, but it certainly includes Corky, it includes Tilikum, and it includes all those other wild horned whales out there. Um, they all deserve a better life, and um, we need to treat all of these animals better, both in captivity and in the wild. And that's uh, really what we need to be here about. Thank you.